So you are on mute, sir. Sorry, my apologies. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to be part of this panel, absolutely an eminent panel with some of the best brains in India. And we are going to talk about one of the hottest topics, which is Industrial Revolution 4.0 and its impact on skill development, right? And what better topic? And this is being talked about so much. And then I'm going to spend two minutes, uh, you know, before we have a formal welcome for our participants, the eminent panel, and then we'll have uh, a round of speeches, and then we'll also have some discussions going around with this one, right? So let me start with, uh, hello? Am I audible? Yeah. yeah, we are getting you. Please carry on. Okay. Right. So, um, when people talk about Industry 4.0, and while we are talking about Industry 4.0, obviously, the question comes as to what is Industry 1, 2, 3. And I'm going to, not going to bore you with that, but all I'm going to say is the pace at which things change from the mechanical revolution to automation to the computerization to the fourth industrial revolution that is happening now is in a sense scary. Things are changing at a logarithmic scale. And are we in a sense going to leverage on this? I'll just put a point forth and then we will listen to the experts. See the adoption of industry 4.0, it's not necessarily only for the manufacturing sector. Industry 4.0 is going to affect every possible industry, every possible sector. And there are various stages in which one can realize the benefit of Industry 4.0. It will start with, you know, some bit of virtualization or digitalization that happens. And then slowly the sector looks at some value adds that happen as a part of its products and services. Then the third stage, they go to a disruption where this particular organization that has adopted gets into a disruptive change. Then it comes to asset efficiency in the fourth stage. And in the fifth stage, they actually set new normals in which the sector itself operates. So I believe Industry 4.0 is slowly going to be a big game changer of sorts that it is going to define the way things are happening. So naturally, there is a concern as to what's going to, what's going to happen in terms of the skill sets required for the jobs for Industry 4.0. And like it happens, it happened in every industrial revolution that happened, not just in 4.0. There is this big scare, what will happen to jobs? There was a scare when mechanization happened. There was a scare when computerization happened. I remember as a young computer engineer, when I was trying to do this for Reserve Bank of India, there was dharna that happened and would not allow us to work. But look at what has happened. Now it's become the normal. Banking is perhaps the sector that has adopted to uh, IT and uh, um, information technology in a big way. So similarly, now there is a scare with Industry 4.0, what will happen to jobs? All I can say, and I'm going to come back at the end of this, uh, my eminent co-panelists will cover a good part of this. This is going to create a lot of new jobs. Already we are seeing emergence of a lot more new jobs. Obviously, some of the existing ones will move on. And there'll be new jobs that are going to create be created. So we're going to discuss today, we have eminent panelists, nine panelists amongst us, and I'll introduce them as we go. We're going to discuss in terms of how is industrial revolution four point industrial revolution four point zero going to affect jobs, job profiles, and hence the skill development in this country. Over to you, Maninder. Maninda, sir, your voice is not clear, sir. We are not, we are not able to hear you, Maninda. Thank 
Sir, a little bit, but there is a lot of disturbances from your answer. Robin, I suggest we can move to the next speaker and maybe later on he can join once he is set. Thank you. Mr. Narayan, sir, can you please introduce Mr. Debra so, Singh? So, what should we move on? Yes, please. Okay. Sir. Lovely. Okay, so we will come back and listen to Maninder as we go. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Devraj Singh, Vice President and Head for Technical Standards at the Electronic Sector Skill Council of India. As you know, the Sector Skill Councils are playing a human role in bringing industry standards and uh, what is uh, the kind of quality standards and uh, what the industry requires in those particular sector and for uh, Electronic Sector Skill Council, uh, Dr. Devraj Singh is playing a key role as an IIT engineering graduate with a deep knowledge, especially in the areas of uh, skilling in solar technology, telecom, process industry, with a Six Sigma perspective and has over 25 years of rich experience in India and across the globe. He's presently working uh, as the Vice President and heads the technical team and standards. Over to you, Dr. Devraj Singh. Thank you very much uh, for such a nice introduction and good afternoon to all esteemed panelists and everyone present here. It is an honor to be here with you today. And since I am uh, the first speaker in the row, so contact setting uh, will be uh, now uh, upon me. So uh, as you know, industrial 4.0 revolution is the next stage in digital transformation. While it, it started in manufacturing, it is now impacting financial services, life sciences, and all other industrial sectors. You name any, uh, it is impacting them. It is driven by big data, powerful analytics, a rise in computing power, increased connectivity, new methods of human machine interaction, and advances in transmitting digital directives to the physical world. Currently, in, it encompasses a wide range of advanced technologies. Uh, you must be hearing those buzzwords. That includes artificial intelligence, machine learning, Internet of Things, automation, robotics, additive manufacturing, which all are the enablers for Industry 4.0. Like the first, second and third uh, industrial revolution, Industry 4.0 is transforming not just our world, but also the physical world of work. As new technologies are increasingly adopted, companies will need talent with the skill to leverage them. Yet without a definite view of exactly what technologies will be developed and how they will impact work, how can companies prepare their workforces and ensure they remain competitive? With technological advancement occurring at an accelerated rate, it's increasingly challenging for employers to find talent with the right competencies. In effect, what is currently transpiring in the workplace is a growing skill mismatch between what companies need and what talent can offer. There are four reasons I see for this. So first and foremost reason uh, which I see is there is the growing role of automation in existing occupations. 60% of the occupation consists of at least 30% of the task that can be automated. As a result, jobs are changing with the talent, taking on more high level and strategic roles. Consequently, Without reskilling, they will simply become displaced. Second is, uh, there is an acutely heightened demand or need for talent with advanced technological skills to work with new technologies such as artificial intelligence, data analytics, robotics, blockchain, in settings ranging from smart factories to network supply chains to training simulation for hospitals even. Third, as technologies become more advanced, and machine become smarter. People will not only utilize machines in their current occupation, new roles will develop, and that have to do with programming, supervising, and troubleshooting interconnected machines. Fourth, many more technologies are likely to be developed. Again, we currently can't foresee which skill those technologies will entail. Nevertheless, by 2030 35, 
between 25 million and 50 million new tech jobs are expected to be created worldwide. Uh, you remember uh, uh, Y2K phenomena? Uh, there, everybody was saying that uh, saying that uh, computers will be taking over the world and uh, we will uh, have a scarcity of jobs. But you see what is the end result. So, on similar uh, fashion, every decade actually gives uh, such technological uh, disruptions. And those disruptions in uh, uh, in true sense actually creates a lot of uh, new uh, tech jobs uh, eventually. So as a result of these factors, companies are facing right now two threats. If they don't have the skills they need to operate effectively, they will lose their competitive positionings. In addition, if they can't reskill their current workforces, they will face the heavy financial burden of displaced workers. The answer to skill mismatch is to ensure workers have access to continued education throughout their careers in order to remain productive and innovative. Consequently, employees, employers need to take responsibility for the reskilling of their own workforce to ensure they have access to exact industry specific and occupational specific competencies they need as industry 4.0 progresses. Unfortunately, it is inevitable that some workers will be displaced. Nevertheless, this is also an area where external expertise can help organizations create effect effective strategies that benefit both the company and the workers. Ultimately, Industry 4.0 is already here and it's impacting the world of work in ways few imagine. As we progress into this new phase, the impact will become more widespread until it is felt by every business across the world and India, in fact. For this reason, building a relationship with a skilling body like ESSEI, Electronic Sector Skill Council of India, in a timely manner is nothing sort of a strategic decision that can define the future success. In this regard, ESSEI is already working with industry majors like Siemens, Schneider, Presto, SMC, ABB, to name few, etc., uh, to come up with the skill specific certificate, diploma, advanced diploma, and degree courses for the academia. Objective here, here is to facilitate and create job ready resources and to integrate national skill qualification framework uh, that is umbrella framework for all skilling activities in India and international specification within the undergraduate level of higher education in order to enhance employability of the graduates in meeting global workforce requirement. So uh, idea here is since we are sitting at uh, uh, a demographic dividend stage where 60 percent of our population is uh, less than 30 years of age we can definitely uh, be uh, uh, we should definitely be meeting the global workforce requirement by uh, producing a lot of skilled manpower in every regard thank you thank you thank you dr devraj singh you made some really important points uh, the issue starts with the skills mismatch. You know, when things change, we don't realize that things are changing. And that's exactly what is happening with Industry 4.0 slowly creeping in. There are a lot of jobs that require newer skills because there are newer expectations in the market. And as you rightly said, the mismatch in skills can only be bridged if there is continuous skilling initiative. It's not just that skilling happens only when at the entry level, that there should be continuous skilling that needs to happen. And you very rightly pointed out. The other thing that you talked about is, in my view, very relevant. I just want to highlight that, which is about the standards, quality standards and skilling certificates, particularly that has global recognition. In your sector, particularly, sir, as you know, many of our uh, youngsters might be working abroad, not just in India. So I, you can't emphasize more the reason why we should have global standards. And you very rightly pointed out, and with a young population, uh, India is going to be soon a workforce for the world. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. So it's my pleasure now to turn to my good friend, Dr. Sindhya Chintala. Dr. Chintala uh, has her doctorate in a very unique uh, area, cognitive process of how mind absorbs information. And it's not a surprise that she's a foremost expert in the assessment process with the Sector Skill Council, a vice president at NASCOM, and also executive director of the IT, IT enabled services sector skill council. Dr. Sandhya Chintala has a rich background in international and national education management. 
Her role at NASCOM includes the NASCOM's education initiatives, development of industry standards to facilitate a quality talent pool, liaison between industry, academia, and government, and making India the preferred global destination. And what NASCOM does is, is uh, uh, certifies the great work that Dr. Sandhya Chintala and her team is doing. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you, Narayan. And could you uh, kindly let me share content? Uh, somebody sure. on the other side. Yeah. I still can't use the share button. Hello. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Sochan, and my fellow panelists for this wonderful uh, opportunity to share uh, the issue at hand and also to solution it, because that's what I presumably think this whole uh, panel discussion is all about. So skill development and emergence of Industry 4.0 are very much interlinked at the hip, and one cannot survive without the other. So having said this, uh, since my uh, Ms. Devraj has earlier already articulated many pertinent points, let me just go to reiterate that very strongly. That definitely in Industry 4.0, with uh, Industry 1.0 being about the steam engine, 2.0 being about electricity power, 3.0 being about uh, computing and connectivity, and 4.0 basically is on these five points, but focused on the power of disruptive technologies, which we think is otherwise called emerging tech. Now, the fast forward button has been pressed. What we thought will happen a decade later has actually been brought forward by the COVID. So it is an unfortunate incident, but it has thrown forth a plethora of opportunities that we need to look at so that job seekers and job creators will look at new frontiers. So the way we live, learn, and the way we work has totally changed. Our research from NASCAR has shown that it will, by 2030, impact. And as uh, my earlier uh, predecessor uh, speaker has spoken, that it will create the automation that will actually disrupt the job scenario. Large number of people are being put out of work, but it is also going to create the opportunities. And if you can see that by 2030, there are about 350 million jobs that are going to be available and of which the incremental work will be about 156 million. But that will be the integration and application of the emerging tech like AI, big data, then you have blockchain, 3D printing, you have is nanosensors, uh, AVR, augmented, uh, then you have robotic process automation, cloud computing, IoT, cybersecurity, and the list goes on. So those will be actively used for greater efficiency and scale, as well as customization to requirements. So we talk of precision agriculture, then digital manufacturing, retail and wholesale, construction, including precision construction, transportation, government, education, finance, healthcare, of course, and of course, the food industry and others. All of this are having massive changes but this is going to throw over a huge number of job opportunities, which if optimized with the appropriate readiness for individuals and enterprises to actually get ready, we'll be in a far better position and digital India will be there for us to all consume and enjoy. Having said this, let me touch upon very briefly about the businesses. But about 2022, most Indians will work in three buckets. One will be in about 54% will be under an unchanged job category, but 37% will be deployed in jobs that have radically changed because of these emerging tech. But 9% will be in areas that we have even envisaged now. And that 9% out of 600 million working population is almost 54 million new jobs. So it is reimagining business and we have to restructure the Indian economy via its education and skills initiative to actually live on the legacy, but build the future of digital performance here. So when I, the next 40% of all businesses in the next 10 years 
will disappear. Either they have to modify, they have to adapt, or they will die. So for all of this, what India has very smartly done over the last decade, it had a unifying skilling landscape. So we have a systemic process in the country that can actually survive this, right? About 40 sectors, all of these are growth sectors. And by, by 2050, if we are able to play our cards right, India should be a superpower in the first three positions in the globe. Having said this one, what NASCOM, the National Association of Software and Service Companies has done is taken on the position and worn the hat of a sector skill council itself. That way unifying both the industry and the skilling initiative. Identified itself. So I mean, here now in the solution piece, identifying itself in the five sectors where ITS, business process management, engineering, R&D, software and product development and future skills are key. Like if I were to look in the finance and uh, accounting section of the BPM, 54% of the global uh, outsourcing work for this particularly comes from India, right? So now if I look at certain areas in the future skills, which is emerging tech, I take, for example, IoT, which is an area also very close to Cisco as hard, both for cybersecurity and IoT. They were actually working with us and they have built the occupation of IoT, identified the job families, they have actually built up the whole career map, which shows that these are the 32 new jobs, identified the key ones across the various tracks, and then built these standards as a part of the talent agenda, because Sector Skill Council is the job standard setting body and the competency assessment and certification body under the government of India. So we build the standards, we develop faculty to enable these standards to integrate into the university system, which is the supply side, but it also addresses both formal and non-formal. And we build an industry academia connect with major companies and NASCOM per se has about 92% of the industry represented with about $250 billion at its peak and poised with about 90% of the human reports uh, what is a human resource represented, and by about 2030 and 2035 onwards, specifically 20, it's supposed to be about $350 billion. But that will happen only if we play our act right. We need to have a larger outreach where every individual at every level, blue collar, white collar, and the leadership level, all will get enabled with an awareness and the ability to apply and appreciate and encourage job creators to actually bridge the digital divide. So what we have done at our end to solution this is about 2018, we launched what is called the Future Skills Platform. It was inaugurated by the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, who then envisaged that this is a need of the hour. Because one thing that we have learned is before we talk to the world, we have to enable it ourselves. So the 4 million human resource direct employees of NASCOM members, and 20 million others who are indirectly impacted because of the technology that we portray, all have been upskilled. Almost 75% of them have been upskilled. So having put our house in order, we now say, what's going the future be? The future will be to enable the urban, rural, every human being at every economic level, whether they are government officers, the bureaucracy, et cetera, everyone to be enabled to understand what this is all about. So having said this, we've really clearly articulated that what the country needs is just not a combination just of jobs, but an ability to understand the technical components, build competencies, not just not knowledge or a practical ability, but to put these two together to apply it so that we can actually have a larger nation of startups. We have basically a third in the world after US, then China and we. We have about almost 4,000 startups that we have to our credit, but it is not the end. We need a lot more to be able to generate the economy, uh, which will actually be of power to work and work. But professional skills too, like problem solving, design thinking, negotiations, program management, digitization, all of this is also a plethora of skills that need to be brought into play. So what the Future Skills platform now does is we have said, okay, we've done it for our industry. We reached out through academia and one of the great academia players that have helped us in this process has been Cisco Two Points and Decad, which Murugan will speak to you much later. But what we did was join the dots. 
So having joined the dots, we are able to actually now bring forth a new platform, which is called the Future Skills Prime. This is in collaboration with the Ministry of IT, which is our line ministry, and in consultation with the Ministry of Skills, MHRD, as well as UGC, AICT, DGT, etc. Everybody can coalesce. This is an aggregator platform where content players globally are able to offer foundation program, bridge programs, and deep skilling programs, which are NOS enabled or NOS aligned on this platform to an outreach population of at least 40 million people in the next 20 years. And hopefully the conversion at least will be about four and a half lakh people will get certified, which means four and a half lakh people will be available to actually work for this nation, to build this nation into a digital economy and be called the greatest human resource talent hub for the world. That has been Mr. Modi's dream. So has it been ours and our president, Nascom, say, just like Israel is known for being the talent hub, India can be known to be, I'm sorry, Israel has been known to be the startup hub. India should be the talent hub for the world. There's never been a time of greater promise or greater peril. Because today, with this sort of digitization and the COVID that has come to be, it's not going to move away. This industry body has ascertained that even post COVID, the new normal is there to be, which means almost 75 to 80% of the workforce will work from home. This leads to a new opportunity where individuals who are properly skilled and certified on transnational standards, which is what this IT industry is all about, will now have work in the gig economy or the hustle economy where in which there is no particular loyalty to a company, but you may probably uh, be working for, uh, say, a, a company like Intel for the, in the US, and you would have a job here in Coimbatore, as well as you might also have some part of your work as an entrepreneur. So you will actually be doing pro project-based work, problem solving. So it's your skills that will define you. It's your competency that will be certificate that you can do. India needs to actually come together and associations like Association, NASCOM, CI, Priti come together because it's not which uh, the big fish which eats a small fish. It is a fast fish which eats a slow fish. The ability to innovate and the speed at which we will do it will determine the winners. So together, we feel, let's build digital India and industry 4.0 will not be far off. Thank you so much for your time. I'm open to questions as we have the time to actually make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. As always, very pertinent. We also shared. Sorry, why is the Doctor, can you mute the mute, please? Yeah. Okay, I think this is better now. Okay, so thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. As always, a lot of wisdom in what you just said. I'm just, uh, you know, some of the things stuck me and I thought like, you know, creating 54% jobs remain unchanged is actually good news. And I thought the number could be far less. But you also said 9% just don't even exit, exist today. And they are going to be something that we will discover as we go. Very interesting. And uh, when, you know, building careers, of these job roles that are just emerging is phenomenal. And I'm glad NASCOM has taken this on a proactive basis. Future skills platform, I've been part of this, wonderful. And to look at not just the 4 million who are directly working with you, and I suspect it's going to be much more than 20 million as we go. And that in, in a sense is going to define. But not, but not the least, the, what you said about the professional skills along with technical skills, right? Each industrial revolution has brought in a new culture, like it was the industry culture that came in at some factory culture that came in at some point of time. Then there was this IT culture. Now they talk about some digital culture that is emerging, including the gig workers that you just said, and the loyalty to the job and not to the employer and many, many such things that are being attributed. But I'm glad you touched upon not just the technical skills, but also the professional skills that are required to survive in this uh, you know, new world of uh, industrial revolution 4.0 and its impact in job roles. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. So I'm going to now turn to, I mean, uh, Dr. Sandhya spoke about innovation and she also talk, talked about the good work 
uh, you know, Morgan is doing as a part of Cisco. So we turn to him. Morgan leads the social innovation group for Cisco in India and South Asia. And his team is responsible for all the social investments around human needs, education, economic empowerment. And thank you, Murugan, you're doing a great job, you along with Cisco. And it includes programs like Networking Academy and many of the CSR investments that Cisco Network uh, Networking Academy is doing across the globe. And it has reached out to already 250,000 students uh, a year in India and South Asia is phenomenal. Murugan leads the overall CSR strategy and uh, established the investment framework and strategic partnerships in India with a key focus being on the digital, sustainable and scalable solutions and innovation comes as a part of it. You know, it, it, it's fabulous that Cisco has set a goal of positively impacting 50 million people for in India by 2025. And here is the man who is leading that solution. Over to you, Morgan. We are eager to listen to your thoughts. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Narayan. It was a very generous introduction. Uh, I'm going to jump right in um, and talk about um, 4.0 tomorrow. I, I think, uh, Dr. Sadia, you spoke about something interesting, and it reminded me of an example I can give you on how our world are changing. Um, prior to the pandemic, Cisco had about six cities, offices in about six cities in India, and you know where our uh, you know uh, 12, 12, 15,000 employees were working out of. Post March, we have the same employees working in over 105 towns and cities and maybe even villages, right? So they've all kind of dissipated across the country. So everything is changing, right? Whether it is the way we work or the way you know we get medical treatment or uh, the way we do business, way we you know do meetings like this. Uh, but one thing you know we need to uh, also change along with it is the way we skill, and you know hopefully I can shed some light on that. Um, and these are, of course, the technologies that I don't have to repeat that that are really uh, driving the industry 4.0. The key thing here, and I think the, um, the first speaker spoke about this, is the integration of digital and physical. So I want to keep, you know, keep that in mind as, you, as I go through the rest of the, uh, uh, the, my five minutes. Uh, it's really this is the key concept, I think, that we need to keep in mind as we look for skilling for industry 4.0. Now, the state of skills in India, I'm not going to go through. This is, you know, especially we have people like Dr. J, uh, JP here. He knows this inside out. Message here is we already have a surplus of labor. There's a million people entering the workforce every month. We've heard that stat to death. I feel that this is also a wicked problem because it's an inverse business challenge. You've got to solve this at scale today because you will not have a million people coming out into the workforce 10, 12, 15 years from now as the demographic changes. So it is a wicked problem. It is a very complex problem to solve. And that's why I think we really have to think about how to look at it uh, holistically, quickly, and at scale. Park that thought for a minute and come to what a future-ready workforce should look like. You know, this is, we believe a future-ready employee or workforce is someone with a T-shaped skill set, multidisciplinary um, breadth and multi-system breadth, as well as depth in one discipline and one system. Disciplines is your hard skills, you know, your programming, analytics, IoT, whatever it is. Systems are, you know, healthcare, transportation, education, you know, your vertical of choice. I think, you know, as we as we are seeing now, you know, there is a lot of lessons learned from how a country did implement um, a particular program in healthcare and take that and deploy it in doing something else. So I think that multi-system awareness and knowledge is extremely critical. So this being the foundation for the future ready workforce, how do you then design programs with Industry 4.0 in mind? Um, we use four uh, design principles in everything we do. Nothing, you know, rocket science here, but it really, you know, if you really break it down and look at every program in these four lenses, it really helps. One is it's going to be scalable, and I'm talking India scale, right? Uh, I heard someone say that, you know, uh, 2,000 mice don't make an elephant, right? So you can't create a program in one small city and say, now I can go replicate it, right? So replicability becomes very important as well. So if you need an elephant, you have to design for an elephant. You can't design a small program and say, okay, go replicate it now with all the complexities that exist in India. So scalability at India scale, replicability with all the complexities that is there in India, sustainable by 
virtue of being embedded in a government program. We have Dr. JP, we work with him on uh, with, uh, with all the ITI systems in the country. And finally, the strong government connect. So if you know, we really need to think about skilling for Industry 4.0 holistically, we believe these are the four tenets of any program that will make it successful, fast, and scalable. Right. Um, so let's look at a couple of examples from our side. Before that, this, you know, again, I found this quote, which I found is interesting. While this technology is like what you call godlike technology, the institutions that we have to work with, whether it is a ministry or the education institution or the the uh, the government bodies, the agencies, the private universities, whatever it is, they still haven't changed. You know, the, the way we operate still is, and this is not a quote on India, by the way, right? This is a quote on, on the Western world. And at the end of the day, the final beneficiary that we have to keep in mind is still dealing with the same emotion that the person was dealing with 120, 200, 300 years ago. So this is really something if you're really working in the social sector, in the impact sector, we got to keep this in mind. Just because there is you know, amazing technology doesn't mean it'll instantly be a huge success in any other sector. So with that in mind, I'll give you a couple of examples of what we've done. Maybe this triggers some ideas. Uh, we did a cybersecurity learnathon, just 15 days. Right. Again, think about a digital plus a physical construct. We just didn't put it out on the internet and say, okay, go do the learnathon. It's it's a MOOC. We all know MOOCs have a ridiculously low participation rate and a even lower completion rate. Right. Now, when you take the concept of a MOOC, put a gamification around it, then work with the existing systems in the physical world, colleges, institutions your numbers dramatically change. In 15 days, we saw a conversion ratio of 75% between registration and participation, which is mind blowing, right? And we also, by the way, if you do some things like this, the gender ratio also is significantly higher than what you normally get in any tech programs, right? That's one example. The other example is, again, what we work, do work with the DGT is uh, we've established the Future Right Skills Consortium with uh, Accenture, Cisco, and now JP Morgan joining as well. And, along with Quest Alliance and a few other um, entities in the scaling ecosystem, look at again, 250 plus hours of gamified content, aligning it with the employability skills curriculum that um, the, the ITI is run. Do a blended model, make it available on Bharat Skills portal, but also make it part of the curriculum in the ITIs. Again, do the digital physical mix. And within a few months, you know, we're reaching 100,000 plus ITI students with best in the world content around life skills, employability, skills, communication skills, back to the important skills that Dr. Sandhya spoke about. Again, this won the AVPN, the Asia Venture Philanthropy Network Award for a collaborative philanthropy. So I think this is something, you know, that it's a model that we can uh, take forward uh, for uh, how we think about skilling as well. And finally, one quick kind of adjacent example, but may trigger some ideas. You know, this is how it used to be. You know, someone wrote a book, someone bought the book and the teacher read it to the students. In this case, I think it's uh, Rohan who wrote this book in English. Now, what Pratham Books did with Cisco's help and putting in an, uh, a digital platform is today, Rohan's book can be translated by Poonam in Hindi, by Jui in Marathi, by Sheila in Tamil, and so on. It has been translated to over 50 languages within a matter of days, each with localized infographics and you know content and other things. Someone put it up on YouTube. And before you know it, within two, three weeks, this book is reaching tens of thousands of students. Can we think about skilling with this angle, especially in India, where localization vernacular is so important? So uh, we've taken some of the elements for the NetAcad program itself. The program has grown 500 uh, percent in the last three years. We reach about a thousand students a day uh, in the last 90 days. And uh, it's largely because of our partnership with institutions like NASCOM, uh, like DGT, uh, like or, you know many other state governments. We have government partnership with AP, Telangana, Haryana, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, um, and you know that idea of taking a digital combination, blended learning model, work with the existing physical institutions, and eventually have the final goal of that student in mind, really uh, works for us. And you know we're on you know we're on track to reach. Uh, half a million, 500,000 uh, students in this uh, calendar year alone. So that's, you know, kind of a brief uh, on what uh, we have been able to do, taking those design tenets into practice in our own program. Um, I just want to leave you with, um, with three things. Uh, I think the, you know, if you, we got to build it for India, 
uh, you know, Atman Nirbhar is not just a tagline. It, it's a nice tagline for political purposes, but again, it really is true. You have to localize, you have to take the digital infrastructure of India into mind when you're thinking of skilling programs for that. We have to collaborate. There is no selfishness. There is no brand in skilling. It has to be open. All courses have to be available on open platforms, integratable into anything else. It doesn't matter. So if you look at NetAcad content, only three out of the 35 courses are Cisco related. We have courses on programming and various other things. Uh, it's just purely in terms of how to skill the next generation. And finally, we are deluding ourselves if one company thinks we can change or skill for Industry 4.0. We have to work with the government in a systemic manner, and that's the only way to do that scale and in, in a quick time. Back to you, Naren. Thank you, Murugan. That was really wonderful. And, uh, you know, um, some of the things that I thought it's worth highlighting is the most often talked about the T-shaped skilling, like, you know, some of many skills but at the same time have deep in one of them. But what I really liked was, uh, you know, the four tenets that you had, scalable, sustainable, replicable, and most importantly, the government connect. And you also touched upon later as to how skilling is something that, you know, everybody needs to contribute and nobody can really think that they can, they can do, the, especially in the digital world and like the magnitude of skilling that is required. But I also like, and it's worth highlighting again, E.O. Wilson's quote, like, you know, where, I mean, I thought that was about India. When you said it's global scale, then maybe, I mean, that's one, uh, you know, the industrial 4.0 revolution kind of has a common platform for many things across the world, the paleolithic, uh, uh, you know, uh, emotions, medieval institutions and godlike technology that's now available for everybody. Very well put, but I thought, the highlight of what you said, which I like to take forward, is how the whole concept of online digital cannot be effective unless it is put to use along with the uh, you know, brick and mortar concept. So, like you said, the MOOCs plus gamification plus the existing format that is available did the trick for you. And, and thanks for sharing all those things. Thanks also for sharing how, as an example, you took on localization and how digital technologies, in this case, the translation help. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, uh, Morgan. And I'm going to now turn to uh, Mr. Manoj Balachandran, our next speaker. Uh, Mr. Manoj Balachandran is the head of CSR function of another, uh, you know, uh, IT great, IBM India, and he's uh, uh, IBM, and he's head of the CSR function for IBM India and South Asia. Based out of Bangalore, comes out of uh, more than 22 years of experience, um, most of it in IT industry. And Manoj has been part of building teams, and he's been building teams, uh, you know, application teams that has gone and executed ERPs. You know, e-commerce packages, infrastructure, and many of those things. So his experience in actually working with the people who been who are now leaders and his technology leadership roles, like in cloud migration and account management in various organizations that he has worked, is going to be of uh, immense use for us while I invite uh, Mr. Manoj Balachandran to share his views. So thank you so much, Mr. Narayan. Um, I know, I know that you kind of set a good context about my background there, but essentially with my background and uh, the experiences which I've seen, this is one of the biggest changes which we're seeing in the next few years, the kind of skills, skills requirement which, which we are uh, seeing in the industry is just, just way different, right? And uh, thank you so much for uh, Ash, Cham and uh, for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to be a part of this event. A very good afternoon to all the respected uh, panel members and to our virtual audiences here. So, um, you know, it's 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 one of the most important issues which are which we are facing in this country today, right? About uh, our ability for the jobs of tomorrow, right? As uh, Dr. Devraj, Mr. Morgan, Dr. Sandhya, all of them have kind of put some of these numbers into context. I would like to again. Just, just reiterate, uh, you know, how India is actually placed, right? India has obviously got the largest working population in the world, uh, with more than 62% of the country's population in the in the age group of 15 to 59. 
and and as dr devraj was mentioning that 54% of them is <laughs> in below 25 years and that's the strength of india and but the but the um a skill person for them to find a job is a struggle right to find a very very skilled person for the job at hand is a struggle in every industry now now just like um in the manufacturing field in the it it es field everybody is going through this transformation and just just looking at the shortages of tech jobs now um will india was going to struggle to find close to 230000 skilled tech jobs in the field of just big data and ai and by 2021 the shortage is apparently going to go up to 780000 vacant jobs now that's the kind of um expectations which the industry has got in in terms of filling out these uh, uh job market right so just going to the world economic forum 2018 where they were talking about those main four main uh, technology advances uh, like 5g high high speed internet artificial intelligence big data analytics cloud computing iot all those emerging tech which uh, could not have been more true in 2019 when covid suddenly advanced some of these technology adoptions big time across the world right uh, companies did have to double or triple their technology adoptions to continue just their engagement with their customers um, with the manufacturing and supply chain space with their employees as well uh now now these four technologies absolutely are affecting this about um population this uh population who is actually in the working age group right now who ever thought of bandwidth and speeds at a time at our homes until we were forced to work from home and and learn from home now many of us have had multiple devices connected online throughout the day right and we have learned that just 1 gb is easily consumed by a toddler while streaming a favorite cartoon movies on netflix or amazon prime every day so let's talk about some of those and how that actually makes a difference right some of these uh, some of these technologies now just ai just the ai and its omnipresent nature now obviously ai is there in every field which you can you think of right right from simple things on websites like chatbots and and virtual assistants ai is going to be in agriculture and farming and airline industry retail shopping fashion security and surveillance sports analytics uh, manufacturing broad production for sure um like simple things like livestock and inventory management self driving cars and autonomous vehicles healthcare uh, warehouse and supply chain um you know even these even these smartphones which we are which we are walking around uh, is all just ai power day you're walking around with ai every day you're doing online shopping every day right and and these are stuff which are the the youth of today need to understand that ai is only present it is absolutely there everywhere now just taking examples of of uh, data analytics if you look at the day at data analytics the amount of data which we are producing every day is just mind boggling um it is estimated that we actually create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every day that's 18 zeros in a quintillion right so that one hexabyte is one uh, quintillion bytes so 2.5 hexabytes of data which is actually produced every day that's likely to go up to 463 hexabytes by 2025 that's the amount of data which we are actually creating just instagram alone i think uh, we are uploading up close to 95 million photographs and videos every day on instagram and now let's look at just iot my right? internet of things now you're surrounded by devices which are inter inter connected by by the end of this year we we would potentially have around 35 billion devices which are talking to each other by end of 2021 the 35 billion is going to go up to 50 billion just the market alone 
is going to go from 248 billion estimated to go up to 1560 billion by 2025 just the iot a market and then there is the market of cloud obviously there is uh, the private cloud the public cloud the hybrid cloud uh, the public cloud is supposed to go up to uh, 200 and 230 billion dollars uh, in 2019 that's the estimated by uh, uh, gartner um, it's a cumulative growth of around 17 percent the private cloud is going to go up uh, to around uh, 70 billion dollars by 2024 which is a CAGR of around 25 percent growth there even the hybrid cloud market is tremendously growing with around 20 percent growth and supposedly reaching around 128 billion dollars by 2025 now all these numbers are great right and all these numbers all the uh, forecasts um, really gives us a peek into the future of opportunities but how do we prepare for that how do we ensure that the employers in these industries find the right skills now, just to make the argument simple, you know, we can kind of split the problem into three categories. Now, how do we ensure that the current workforce is constantly reskilling and upskilling in their constant changing environment? That, well, that's one. The second is, how do we ensure that the young workforce coming into the industry has the right skills for employment? How do they hit the road running? And the third was, how do we inspire the kids in school who are you know, anywhere between the age groups of 12 to 18 and inspire them into the world of emerging tech. Now, obviously, for the first category of addressing current employees and their skills is largely left to the organizations and the HR teams who actually uh, have to take on this, this, this huge responsibility of scaling, reskilling, and making sure that they are uh, current, right? Now, are they investing in their employee skills by allowing them to work on technologies outside of the co-work. Um, and obviously the big names like Cisco, IBM, Accenture, or the world, um, I think we all have huge platforms, internal pla uh, platforms which we have all in invested in. Now, should the small and medium companies invest in content creation or should they just take advantage of available platforms? And, and I think uh, I would definitely concur with what uh, Mr. Moore mentioned about having strategic partnerships where we can actually offer some of these platforms, just like Cisco has got their uh, platforms, uh, scaling platforms. IBM has also got their uh, scaling platforms. Uh, we have multiple platforms called Open P Tech and Skills Build, which uh, are being made um, available for other partners to actually use it. Now, and also can the government make it lucrative for private players to share their internal learning platforms right for others to take advantage of so those are things which we should we should possibly uh, consider the second category of those young workforce who's coming into the industry right and not having the right employable skills um, is an obviously an age-old uh, problem and it's a factor of many many things now are they taught the right subjects in classes is the curriculum keeping track with the changing times in the institutions right are the teachers who are training them getting trained and keeping up with the changing curriculum now do the students get enough industry exposure to give them a trailer of what to expect when they enter the working market right now can the again can the government incentivize corporates to take on internships because once you have the students uh, coming into corporates and having them an exposure, giving them an exposure to this is what the corporate expects out of you. This, these are the skills which are required. Um, I think they will be much, much better employable once they actually come in, right? And with, especially with the uh, with the government's new OSP regulation being taken away with some of these work from home and work from anywhere policies, getting a lot more industry friendly. How can corporates actually welcome again these internships will become virtual internships at much larger scale right and the most important thing is also creating a mentor coaching model uh, is it possible for the industry to sign up to be mentors and coaches for these young learners from the colleges before they actually hit the job market now the last bucket of of, of uh, uh, which we are talking about are kids who are still in school, right? 
Now, how can we motivate them to look beyond TV, mobile, social media, the online shopping, which they're really, really engaged in, and give them insights into how these mediums actually work, right? What goes into providing these experiences and how can they be creative in their own space? I mean, for example, the government's ATL programs are a great way to instill a sense of uh, creativity and innovation in kids. Now, does it have the ability to get into mainstream curriculum, right? Our, our national education policy did give a big emphasis on, on more practical education than theoretical inputs. But, and it also places a huge emphasis on building teachers' capacity, right? The teachers' capacity building on emerging technologies most vital because they are the influencers for our future generation. And uh, uh, also one way to also to fund these programs is by creating central programs with implementing NGOs and knowledge partners and make it easy and transparent for corporates to actually spend their 2% uh, CSR funding. So, so these are some of my thoughts which I actually had in this particular space. And I really want to um, thank Asu Chim and, uh, and the panel for giving me an opportunity pre to present my thoughts and really dreaming of a time when we would become the skills capital of the world. Over to you, Mr. Narayan. Thank you so much, Manuel. Thank you so much. You gave you a plethora of inputs, I should say, like having touched upon various aspects of being very, very rich in terms of what you said. So I'm not going to repeat all of them, but uh, you know I was fascinated by the digital everywhere, the ubiquitousness of how it almost looked like it was an invasion by digital technologies into every sector, every job role, everything that you can do. And it's a bit scary at one level, but it was also uh, the statistics that you said, you know, 780,000 vacant jobs by 2025 also means that while we are worried about losing jobs, you're also saying there are so many jobs up for grabs in a manner of speaking. But I just want to highlight the few things that you said. You know, you gave examples of AI, IoT, cloud, and also across the value chain, the mobilization, training, reskilling. But you emphasized on strategic partnership, which Murugan also rightly said. You know, how should we come together and do this? So how should the philanthropy extend beyond the organizations? And it could be content and platform. For all you know, it could extend to you know, faculty assessment, various parts of it that could you know, seamlessly we collaborated. And also you touched upon how government should make it lucrative. And Dr. JP is listening very intently, so I'm sure he will note that how government can step in and make it lucrative for private sector. That's a part of his role also to make sure that, you know, the private sector's participation is, uh, you know, expanded and widened in a manner of speaking. And you also talked about corporate's response to it's a fantastic point. I'm also taking it away in terms of how can the corporates reach out to be mentors, you know, providing the kind of internships that is required, touched upon Atal Tinkering Lab. And in fact, I'm happy to say I was a part of the NEP expert committee. One of the things that the NEP says is vocationalization from sixth grade onwards. I think it's a great step forward, not just to instill uh, the fun of being part of a skill development and also, you know, that's a, a part of the regular curriculum. And so, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not something that uh, is a separate uh, stream or anything like this. So the dignity of labor and other things are taken care of. Plus, it also gives that necessary impetus for people to be rightly skilled even when they come up for higher education. So thank you so much, Manoj. Thanks for uh, sharing your thoughts. Now I'm going to move on to our next speaker, uh, Venkatesh Sarvasiddhi. Venkatesh Sarvasiddhi is a senior head for digital skills and innovation with the National Skill Development Corporation. National Skill Development Corporation, as you know, is pioneering in the area of not just short-term skill development, but also promoting skill development, particularly private sector participation. So he has the digital skills innovation industry partnership and CSR engagements to build a policy and framework for skilling motion in India. Under his uh, initiative, uh, you know, to empower you, he leads the innovation practice in uh, with uh, you know engaging with the startup ecosystem fostering uh, growth by building scalable, sustainable technology skilling platforms, particularly for predominantly Kaushal Vikas Yojana, which is uh, the world's largest short-term skill development program. What's very interesting is also like, you know, uh, when uh, uh, he is also the Shervinin Gurukul Fellow of King's College London, which is not at all easy. 
So welcome, uh, uh, Venkatesh. Uh, please share your thoughts. Thanks, uh, Narayan, and I can see a lot of my colleagues and partners also on the call. So uh, good to see Sandhya, then uh, Murgan, and uh, Narayan. So we also been in fact Manoj. Uh, and we also recently partnered on certain interesting initiatives at IBM. So, you know, many of you have already touched upon the requirement uh, of the industry partnerships uh, with the government and looking at that model. I would like to comment that, you know, the PPP model is something that will really kick off well if we can leverage the partnerships and uh, which can take us to the next level. So, especially in the COVID times, uh, we have seen and NSDC and other eSkill India initiative. Uh, we have partnered with 24 different firms, you know, uh, as big as maybe a Microsoft and Amazon to an IBM uh, to, you know, to SMEs and micro SMEs and including some interesting startups, uh, which can enhance and uh, create value, especially uh, when physical lockdowns were happening. How do we drive that connect with the ecosystem? The advantage, uh, you know, we have at NSDC is the uh, presence in almost every district of India. So we have uh, more than 20,000 plus training centers, uh, which are cut across almost every district of India. You name a district and have the presence there. And uh, also the kind of an reach we have, you know, we felt that, you know, strategic partnerships with organizations can take us to the next level of delivering them, you know, not only the technology, but also bringing in expertise from various players. So that kind of a collaboration model really works. So I think it's not just about uh, NSDC. In fact, most of the organizations across the world in a pandemic like this have realized that they have to be more interoperable as platforms and they have to come together to solve the problem. So, you know, I want to take some of the examples of uh, some interesting partnerships we have driven in the last six, seven months. Uh, for example, we worked with Khan Academy. Uh, you know, the foundational mathematics course was missing. Uh, in the ecosystem and especially in the blue collar workforce, foundational mathematics is extremely important. Uh, when they do their wage calculations to various aspects of uh, you know financial needs. So with Khan Academy, we uh, you know we are, we you know piloted a model of launching foundational mathematics course and made it a NAS, a national occupation standard. And that was one of the most interesting course we have created in this time frame. Uh, this is one such example. You know, wherein you know Khan is coming from a content perspective, they understand the content very, very well. And we are now applying gamification of the content so that the completion rates are also better. So when Satya Nadella has announced a uh, global opportunity of scaling 25 million people and Microsoft's commitment to do that, uh, NSDC was the first organization in the world to actually partner with them and bring that program to India, under which they are training actually one lakh youth. Uh, on MS Office and uh, digital skills, which can empower them, help them in getting a job in this kind of a pandemic. The other thing is also about diversity. Uh, you know, the the remaining, uh, you know, we are looking at, you know, scaling the program uh, and initially doing a pilot with one lakh girl children, girls who are in technology, uh, girls who are in the blue collar workforce and skill them uh, with the help of Microsoft. So that's a beautiful partnership, you know, which is in, in place. And similarly, we brought in LinkedIn, now, uh, you know, LinkedIn has a very interesting uh, concept of LinkedIn Learning now, which is made available. So we worked exclusively with LinkedIn in launching LinkedIn Learning and a lot of courses, uh, you know, which are aimed at, uh, you know, scaling it close to 3 million kind of people in the next 12 to 24 months. So, you know, these are some of the partnerships which will uh, help us encourage to reach out to the final uh, audience with value propositions, which can be focused around employability. Similarly, you know, uh, Manoj and team, in fact, worked with us in doing a very interesting partnership on Open P Tech, uh, which is a suite of platforms on Industry 4.0, as this conference is also more about the emergence of Industry 4.0. So they curated very interesting courses on Industry 4.0, absolutely free of cost. With the help of NSDC, now we are making these courses available through eSkill India to the entire ecosystem. Uh, similarly, you know, I, I have at least there are tons of other companies in the partnership mode. We are also working with Google as Sundar Pichai's vision of doing a digital India um, and a digital India fund. We are looking into curating the content and launching an, a kind of an partnership with the YouTube so that the content is available for people in vernacular languages so that people can use the content, leverage the content and take the next step. I think exploring these partnerships, uh, gone are those days of working in silos, whether it is you know private companies or institutions or government. 
I think it's an opportunity for all of us to collaborate and see what is the value add we can bring onto the table in terms of the reach, and what is the value add the industry can bring onto the table. Uh, whether it is a platform, whether it's a product, whether it is an online uh, assessment tool, depends. You know, for example, we work with uh, uh, not only the global chains I'm talking about. Uh, you know, uh, look at a company like an Upgrad. You know, they they were actually partnered actively with us during the physical lockdown time frame in transforming the physical classrooms into virtual classrooms. And uh, you know, we are more than happy to look at startups. Uh, you know, organizations which are emerging, and also at the same time. The large organizations which really want to uh, actively uh, work with us and driving their initiatives with the help of the scale what we have. So together, if I look into all of this, we have seen almost uh, a 1500 percent jump in our East India audience. People who are enrolling, that number is on a rocket sky right now. It's moving up as exponentially, and we are seeing good results in terms of enrollments are concerned. I think as we go forward, I somehow believe. Content and content uh, aggregation would not be a challenge, but content curation would be a major challenge. How do you discover and ensure that the content is uh, put in the right format is going to be important. The second thing is also the, uh, the completion rates. So if you look into globally, edX, Udacity, Coursera of the world, 15 to 20, 20 to 25 percent completion rates. So that's where I think we need to have more gamified content. I think Murkan touched upon it. You now we need to have more of gamified content. Into the context so that you know it can help the Gen Z and the millennial population, you know, and sustain their interest and complete their courses, and that can reward take them to the next reward this of digital life. So I think that piece requires a lot of work, and a lot of Indian content providers have to think around gamifying the content in multiple languages. I think that's going to be the key, especially uh, you know next. Uh, two to four quarters or six quarters till the time we find some uh, vaccination and solution for the pandemic. You know, we will we expect that the virtual uh, scenarios will uh, continue. Gamification of the content becomes very very necessary as we go forward, and we are working with a couple of them and introducing some of these uh, uh, Indian content players uh, in different languages. That also makes a lot of difference. So you know, overall, I would say it's a it's a time for collaboration. You know. All of us come together and find a solution and those ways of uh, operating in silos. So that's it. I think I would keep it short so that uh, others can get their time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Venkatesh. You, you just highlighted something that we've been discussing. Every speaker has been saying, which is to do with collaboration, which is to do with bringing together those elements that makes it interesting. You touched upon almost all the major IT companies, Microsoft, um, LinkedIn, IBM, Google, and also the newer ones like Upgrad, you started with Khan Academy. It's wonderful to see how NSDC is literally being the glue that will kind of connect every private player who wants to contribute and also do the curation bit. You touched upon that. I like the way you said it's not the content, the content seems to be ubiquitous, it's available or in a sense that you can't procure, but it is curation of the content. And you particularly touched upon gamification, which Murugan also mentioned in detail. So thank you so much for sharing your uh, thoughts, uh, uh, taking the cue there in terms of how collaboration, bringing the private sector to play a meaningful role and deliver together is going to be important. Thanks for uh, your thoughts. So I'm now going to move on uh, to, uh, uh, to our next speaker, who's going to be Professor uh, uh, Dr. Bala. Just one second while I do this. Hello. 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 Yeah, can you? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. R.S. Bawa, who's more than 36 years of teaching experience and who started back in Punjab Agricultural University and today is university is now is the pro-chancellor of Chandigarh University. Uh, he is a life member of the Indian Economic Association, Indian Econometric Society. Regional Science Association of India, Indian Science of Information Theory and Applications, Indian Society of Agriculture and Economics, 
He's played a significant role in institution building and has also held many prominent positions, including being elected the president of the Indian Economic Association of in the year 2001. So, Professor Bhava, it's a pleasure to have you amongst us. Please share your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, let me first of all appreciate SHM, uh, NSDC, IBM and all those who have taken the initiative to organize this seminar, webinar, as we call it. Uh, well, I think the topic is so important, but I wish that uh, one of the four topics should have included role of universities. I have a very strong feeling Industry 404.0 cannot succeed unless universities contribute significantly to this. And uh, role of universities have not been very significant in the first two industrial revolutions but ever since the third industrial revolution we call it industry 3.0 uh, which people believe started in 1970 but in india it, its impact was felt in the 90s uh, especially in the late 90s uh, unless and you know the famous saying started during that time that Famous saying, which has been repeated a number of times by uh, my fellow speakers earlier, that what industry needs is not what is available. So many of the engineers, many of the graduates are not employable. So this term was coined uh, during the period of Industry 3.0, rightly so, because the universities were not impacted, the education was not impacted by um, industrial revolutions in the earlier stages. But it was definitely impacted by Industry 3.0 for a number of reasons, because the technology, ICT, started being a part of the education process, teaching learning process for the first time. Now, what came along with that was also, and it is, I think, a common knowledge for all of us that in our country, teaching of electronics, computer science, computer science engineering, etc., came as late as mid 90s or even late 90s, especially in the Northern India. So this shows that unless the industry, unless the universities are taken along, any kind of industrial revolution is not going to have its full impact. Or I would say full fruition is not possible unless the universities are a part of this. And that is why the academicians coined the term education 3.0 and now education 4.0. As for Chandigarh University is concerned, I believe that we, we were incepted almost uh, at the same time when the term Industry 4.0 was coined in Germany in 2011. Chandigarh University was incepted in 2012. Uh, although in India, we started talking about Industry 4.0 after 19, uh, 2015, 2016, and government started acting in 2017. So what we did here, right from the beginning, we believe that we have to address a few questions. The question of Industry 3.0, Industry 4.0, of course, was not known at that time in our country. And this included, like pointed out by uh, uh, many speakers before, that there has to be involvement of industry in academia, academic planning. So Chandigarh University, what we did here was that we involved industry in all of our decision making regarding academic teaching learning planning and research for example in each one of our board of studies there are at least two industry experts and i am sure ibm and other uh, friends here they will they will bear me out that uh, we had the benefit of industrial support and cooperation right from 2014 when we started courses uh, programs in cloud big data information security in collaboration with ibm Wipro provided us a lab, uh, Tech Mindra provided us a lab, Mindra and Mindra provided us a lab, a number of such initiatives were taken, and this has helped the university in a big way. The second thing which we believed and still believe is very, very important is to promote innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, these are, to my mind, key words, uh, especially they were for Industry 3.0, and to train these students and prepare them to de-learn and relearn very quickly to make them lifelong learners. Now, 
I think uh, the advent of Industry 4.0, as rightly pointed out, it involves AI, it involves IoT, it involves an automation of almost everything, and uh, cloud becomes a uh, order of the day, and so on and so forth. But I want to point out a few things. You know, because of lack of very strong relationship between industry and academia, till late now, till now, we are not getting experts in a few areas of the caliber and level of which they are required. One of the most important area is information security. We find because the training in university started very late. And here I want to just make a reference to the point already raised that there are 50% people population in India below 30 years of age. We have a huge demographic advantage. I'm sorry to say we will have to analyze this. It is not as simple as it's being made out. How many of those people are really scalable to the right level? What is the percentage or ratio of enrollment in higher education institutions? I'm not talking about professional institutions or engineering. Still, it is less than 30%. And I'm again sorry to say this is a hard fact that not more than 50% education institutions are of quality, which are producing quality graduates. So end of the day, what you end up with is a very small percentage of graduates to play with. Now, what level of training and skilling you require, we'll have to decide. Of course, we need all kinds of people. You don't need all high-end people. You need graduates who can innovate, who can be entrepreneurs, who can do high-end jobs, but there can be others who can be skilled in areas like plumbing, like other kind of things. So there are dropouts. There are n number of areas where we have to work. IT and digitization is not the only area uh, which is going to provide jobs to the millions of unemployed youth in this country. Coming back to higher education and high-end uh, skilled people. I think it's time now. And again, I want to remind, even when the uh, Industry 3.0 was realized and it started making its impact in 90s, as I said, even now, there is a dearth of really properly trained and skilled graduates. So it is time, if we want Industry 4.0 to succeed, there should be a very strong industry academia interface, very strong. And I think it is, it is of course, the, the universities have a role. They have to approach the industry. Very rightly pointed out, as my faculty is trained by the industry, not only through FDPs, but also on the floor training. Unless the universities know what is happening in the industry, we will not be able to plan accordingly. Unless we are given some jobs, okay, you do some research, provide us some solutions, we will not be able to rise to the level where we need to or we ought to rise. And at the same time, unless we know what is coming up, what kind of things we need to teach to our students, I think it will not be possible to scale. And, you know, um, I still do not believe that everything can be done online or through digital mode. There has to be internships, real time training to the students, to the graduates. And uh, this experiment has succeeded considerably. I'll give you two examples. We have on our campus HP Center of Excellence, which actually affords the students pre deployment training, which actually they were to undertake after going to the company. So all those students who are selected by the company, HP, they are trained before joining the company here so that time of deployment in, in intervening time is saved for the company and the students are ready to go and join. The similar thing, Wipro uh, Technology Next, that, that Talent Next also, was also established here. IBM, IBM has been doing similar kind of thing. We have an advanced, uh, um, IBM lab for emerging technologies. So I think these things have worked for Chandigarh University and I believe very strongly that I perfectly agree that there has to be a strong association, but I think we'll have to work in a more pragmatic manner. We'll have to identify, we ha will have to help the universities identify the talent early, groom the talent according to the level and the capability that they have and for what purpose are you training them. So ultimately, Universities and industry will have to work together 
to provide outcome based outcome both in terms of academics and in terms of employability outcome based training skilling and education at all levels thank you so much for giving me this opportunity i'll not take a lot of your time so if there are thank any you. question i'll be very happy to thank you thank professor thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and you had some uh, different points and uh, very pertinent ones and very rightly so you talked about the role of universities in skill development and employability which perhaps as you rightly said is one of the institutions that till some time back we relied almost solely for uh, getting the employable youth and if that is not being touched by industry 3.0 and you know if that is missed out in industry 4.0 that will be a disaster of sorts as you rightly said and uh, you know um, uh, you know right you talked about industry experts in the board of studies i think that's a great step and i'm sure steps should be taken by academia as well as industry they should reach out to each other and making sure this happens and you also said a pertinent point which i thought is worth repeating and put for debate later it's not it and digital uh, digitization that is going to be bringing in all jobs how do we make sure that we go beyond this also in industry 4.0 and make sure we train them for some of these areas but very nicely you emphasize the industry academia collaboration and the need for doing that in a meaningful outcome based format to make the youth of this country employable not just in india but in a for, for global audience as well thank you so much for sharing your thoughts professor bawa thank you i'm i'm going to turn to the next speaker mr hanuman naik hanuman naik is the executive director of andhra pradesh St state skill development corporation apssdc is uh, a client of ours kpmg and me I, i had a great opportunity to work with apssdc and very easily one of those first state skill development missions that took its job really seriously and you can see that the way there is almost a skilling revolution that has happened in the state of andhra pradesh which as you know has a lot of rural and uh, tribal and other population the 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 larger andhra pradesh earlier and now the the andhra pradesh state so mr hanuman naik has been playing a key role in this uh, a bachelor of engineering from andhra university he was the district employment officer a regional employment officer a deputy chief of university employment bureau and he was a project director at uh, district rural development agency all giving him that kind of grounding in terms of understanding what is really required on the ground which really reflects on the way APSSDC is able to collaborate with the right set of people and cause this uh, you know the big change that is happening in the skill space in AP over to you sir please share your thoughts uh, thank you uh, narayan ji and uh, thank you asocham and thank you panel experts uh, uh, manoj ji uh, and uh, uh, sandhya ma'am and professor bawa and vengadesh from nsdc uh, first of all uh, i would like to uh, say that uh, it's a glad moment for apscdc that for the year 1920 the ap skill mission that is apscdc has been awarded the best skill state by the association and uh, it's an opportunity for me uh, rather i am today uh, it's, it's a, a pleasure me to be part of this webinar because being a important uh, holding a key role in the apscdc Uh, the the uh, uh, shares and thoughts of the all expertise uh, people who have participated in this um, uh, today's webinar will give me a lot of inputs to plan the skill uh, programs in the Andhra Pradesh and to strengthen the skill ecosystem in Andhra Pradesh further. So as uh, all the speakers rightly pointed out, uh, the the India has been the advantage of uh, democratic dividends, uh, but uh, these people have not been properly nurtured. Uh, it becomes a liability on the uh, shoulder of the uh, Indian society. So it's a fact that uh, there are a lot of so many technologies are emerging, industries are are uh, going for automation and adopting the um, uh, fast moving technologies. but given the uh, uh, the background of the, our economy that still the 70% of the uh, people depend on the agriculture and around 60 65% of the people live in rural areas is it that so easy to adopt this technology by the given the education system what we are following till now uh, to this uh, uh, disruptive technologies or future technologies here uh, there is a lot of uh, the Um, the challenges and a lot of uh, 
um, uh, responsibilities on the shoulders of this uh, the government, academia, industry, and uh, uh, the so-called uh, uh, this NGOs. Everybody, unless we all work together and uh, uh, join our hands to strengthen the skill ecosystem uh, to meet this challenge or to mitigate the issues of this challenge, it's not that much easy. So here I would like to uh, rather uh, sharing the uh, the. Uh, industry. What is the industry 4.0? What are the emerging technologies? All we have we have been discussing, and uh, uh, it is there uh, everywhere. We can find. Uh, but uh, if the uh, the government moves in a right direction, uh, properly associating with the industry and the academias and the corporates, the how the uh, changes in the system and changes in the skill ecosystem comes. I would like to share one or two things. Uh, we can proudly say that after taking the uh, oath of the uh, present CM uh, as a Chief Minister, uh, see Jagan Mohan Reddy, uh, he he totally uh, changed the direction of the skilling process in the Andhra Pradesh. Earlier, uh, we used to uh, give more on the standard skills. Uh, we are not bothered about the uh, uh, new revolutionary skills or the skills as per the uh, industry requirement. So, as per the direction of the Honorable CM, uh, our total thought process has been changed, and uh, and now to strengthen the skill ecosystem, uh, the, the Honorable CM direct the APSST, APSST to establish exclusive dedicated skill colleges uh, in across the each parliamentary constituency, where uh, we are going to associate with the industry partners, academia, and international organizations for. Uh, uh, certification assessments so that our AP people are equipped with the uh, 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 global technologies and uh, uh, they can uh, uh, grab the opportunities not only at Pan India level but the, across uh, uh, the country also, across the uh, globe also. Uh, uh, earlier, uh, um, uh, it is uh, glad that uh, the NSDC Bangladesh has mentioned the NSDC has been associating with a lot of the industry partners uh, over uh, imparting the skills in future technologies. Uh, the APSD is also rightly uh, moving in that direction, and uh, we have been associated with the IBM, uh, Google, um, uh, Facebook. Uh, with the support of the Facebook, we would able to train the rural uh, uh, women in digital technology, especially in entrepreneurship uh, development activities. And through this uh, uh, goal program, uh, we would able to uh, nurture almost to five to ten thousand uh, tribal uh, rural women. Uh, to enhance their uh, uh, digital uh, um, uh, literacy capabilities and uh, to uh, enhance their market for their uh, um, rural products. So some of the major uh, the uh, um, uh, corporates or associations or industries where we, we, we APSDC has undergone uh, association with the uh, like IBM, Bosch, Hitachi, Google, uh, and whatever the earlier speaker mentioned, the Snyder and the uh, and the uh, the Siemens and the Dassault. So I can proudly say today is that uh, uh, we have established 40 um, uh, Siemens centers where the advanced technologies are available and that are being imparted to the uh, engineering third year, final year graduates, so that the moment they come out of the uh, their graduation, they are ready to be absorbed by the industry. In the same way. We have established 70 Dassault systems where the 3D simulation technology is being taught to the uh, civil engineering and mechanical engineering candidates, uh, especially in the field of manufacturing and civil aviation. Like that, uh, we have established uh, for 100 CM skill of uh, uh, center of excellences, where we have associated with the, um, the Google IT, we have associated with the, um, um, uh, we have associated with the, um, uh, like, um, uh, so many uh, industries, uh, they have been uh, participated with the AP, uh, APSSTC and they are, uh, 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 they are uh, sharing their advanced technology knowledge to the our faculty. In turn, our faculty is equipping the students with the latest technologies. And uh, at this point of time, it is uh, I swear, uh, it is reiterate to say that uh, thanks to the COVID, COVID has given us the opportunity to explore so many online platforms. When all the things are being stopped at the state government level, APSDC has excelled their its, its capabilities and uh, exposed so many online platforms. And uh, we could able to uh, train during this last six months 1.40 uh, 
a uh, lack of students in different uh, uh, technologies, maybe from uh, primitive technology to the advanced technology. And uh, we, have, we have trained almost 27,000 uh, faculty. Unless we equip our faculty with the latest technologies, uh, the imparting the skills to the students, it's, it's far uh, uh, from the reality. So in that way, uh, in all aspects, the VBSDC is uh, um, uh, nurturing the students from the school levels also. Here, one more thing, um, uh, with, the, with the association of the strong uh, knowledge partners like uh, Ireland FS and uh, Edu Skills, uh, we are importing the IT computational thinking skills and uh, uh, spoken and communication language skills to the tribal people of from 6th standard to 12th standard. Now, the, the students who are undergoing in the tribal schools in Nook and Garner areas, and know about the internet, or about the, um, the languages, know about the IoT, and know about the app developments also. Uh, this is the platform we are creating from the school level so that they come to the uh, degree level, uh, they are ready to the um, uh, to uh, absorb the uh, the technologies what the require uh, require for the uh, industry. Uh, and we have um, designed uh, uh, some industry customized skill training also. We are working with the industry and like in the Sri City, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, the biggest, uh, the sedge area in the Andhra Pradesh, uh, in uh, established nearby Chennur in Nelluru. We are working, working with the industry and we are designing the customized skill training programs uh, as per the needs of the industry and we and the customer uh, uh, from the um, uh, expert trainers and the industry Partners, we are giving them the industry trainings for some times, and uh, at the moment they they absorbed in the industry, uh, the attrition, whatever is the earlier is the attrition is the bigger issue in the industry now. Uh, with this customized skill trainings, the attrition rate has been uh, come down, and the industry is also very happy that they are getting the talented uh, uh, manpower. And a uh, uh, lot of uh, this financing has been uh, cut down from the industry side to uh, in the uh, on the name of the talent hunting. And another thing is uh, this way uh, to further strengthen the skill skill ecosystem. Our Anand uh, Pradesh CM uh, has been given direction to APSGC for establishing of the skill colleges. Uh, we are going to establish 30 skill colleges exclusively uh, for this. Uh, um, uh, uh, every skill college will have a digital lab and will have a communication lab and advanced technology digital group where uh, we are uh, associating with the industry partners. We are asking the partners to come and, uh, come and associate with the APSDC in uh, establishing the high technology labs where future uh, 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 technology skills can be imparted. Uh, like that, uh, uh, it is a very proud moment that we have been associated with IBM, uh, Google, uh, Bosch, Snyder, uh, Siemens, and uh, a lot many. The, the list uh, is already given. And uh, so, uh, so far, uh, as far as the disruptive technologies are concerned, we have been speaking about the engineering graduates or technical graduates. But uh, we have established the employability skill centers in uh, normal degree colleges also, where we are importing this uh, e-commerce and digital marketing, Python and uh, AWS. Uh, the filter course are being taught to the uh, technical course are being taught to the non-technical candidates so that they can also uh, avail the uh, advantages of the technicality in the, as far as the industry placement are concerned. Uh, these are the some of the uh, initiatives uh, have been taken by the APSSPC. And we have very uh, strong team of uh, trainers. These trainers are being uh, 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 taken TOT from the industrial experts and major corporates. Uh, in that way, we are going. We are strengthening our skill ecosystem. And here uh, we, have, uh, we request the uh, SOCHAM uh, uh, to facilitate the AP skill mission to uh, more have the more association with this industry or corporates as far as the skill uh, colleges and skill university concept, which is uh, being planned to strengthen the skill ecosystem and in, uh, in the Andhra Pradesh. Uh, thank you, Asocham, and thank you all experts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for uh, sharing some of the inspiring thoughts and uh, Congratulations to you and APSPC for uh, the recognition award from ASOCHAM, very richly deserved. Okay. Thank and you, thank you very much. It's also heartening to see that, you know, you've taken a dimension 
uh, you know, in, in a sense, which is new, which is how do you talk about those people who are left out? We are only talking about people who have yeah. the opportunity to do skill education, in technology in digital and related areas. What about those who don't even have access, the tribals, the people who are in rural area, commendable to see how APSSDC has taken this initiative and starting to hear about, uh, you know, the, you know, also the way you are taking to graduates who have invested so much time in education to be skilled and to be industry ready when they go, What which is what Professor Bawa also had mentioned earlier. And the train the trainer concept, the way you are leveraging industry to help them train your trainers and they impart these skills to the students is commendable and 1.6 lakh trainings during the COVID time is also another uh, feather in your cap so congratulations on that too i'm sure thank you, thank you. i'm sure sir the 30 skills colleges that you're establishing in ap is going to be a front runner of sorts and i wish uh, there are more and more colleges that come not just in ap for, uh, across uh, India as well, taking skill education to a completely different level. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your thoughts. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now I have the great opportunity to introduce Dr. JP, uh, Dr. M. Jayaprakashan, who is the Joint Director in the IT Cell, Directorate, of Gen Directorate General of Training. And I don't think he needs an introduction. Part of MSDME, he's got 30 years of experience in research and development imparting skill-oriented training to industry technocrats, youngster, young youths, upgrade their skills in the field of electronics, embedded controls, computer communications, process control information, SCADA, industrial automation, Internet of Things, and the list goes on. There are more than 10,500 trainees who've been touched by them. As the head of IT cell in DGT, uh, he he is uh, he is oh, the de um, and reporting to the additional secretary of course he is in charge of whatever your revolution that you are seeing in the ita space uh, be it in terms of the ncbt mis portal for those of you who have not seen there i would urge them to go and see that the apprenticeship portal that has come up recently the examination some of them even was online uh, affiliations the biometric attendance that is happening e office that was implemented and also many of these ch changes that you see in ITI, including the management of e-learning, online training, blended training systems that you see are all thanks to Dr. JP. So implementation of standard 4.0 industrial uh, revolution or industrial 4.0 courses in the ITI ecosystem is also credited to him. Collaborated with a lot of industries for future skill technological areas and like I said, the online examination and digitally signed certificates, including the digital locker, uh, integration, electronic skill credentials, all of them are forward-looking initiatives that DGT has taken under JP's leadership. Uh, Dr. JP, over to you to share. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your nice introduction. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity provided by Aksasam for this meeting and also uh, thanks to my part, uh, my industrial partners like uh, IBM, Cisco, SSC, NASCOM, and other things. Just one minute, I can. Yes. There is a sharing issue. Yeah, yes, I think it's quantity visible. Yeah, yeah. So very good afternoon to all. And uh, this key issue of the seminar or webinar was very, very, very nice one. One is the issues and the challenges and opportunities of industrial stand 4.0 in skill development, uh, role of 4.0 technology for upskilling and reskilling and skill development training program, role and responsibility of government and industry in promoting industrial 4.0 technology for skill development training program and the emergence of 4.0 technology skill development and way forward. So there are a beautiful presentation and the thought process by the panelists about the industrial revolution. So I don't want to touch more about that, but for the audience side and other people, I want to give you an exposure about the DGT. 
Director General of Training under Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Having your two wings, one is called the training, other one is the trainer sub training. Just I will give you a glance about it. So, in the training, we have the CTS craftsman training offered in the industrial training institutes, which changes from the which uh, the duration of the course from six months to two years. And we offer training on 137 trades. And we have around 15,000 industrial training institutes with a seating capacity of 34 lakhs. Apart from this, we also provide on job training in the industry. The program called Apprenticeship Training Program, where we offer training on 181 designated trade and 81 optional trade from the NSDC side. And we have more than 20,000 industrial establishment. And per year, we are around 4,60,000 students are undergoing. Our Prime Minister vision on this national apprenticeship program is we want to go for 5 million uh, people per year. That's why that is another 10 years target. In the trainers training this is one of the major area called upskilling and reskilling also another part is there. So we offer a trainers training those who instruct to want to work in the ITA system. We offer a training called crafts instructor training scheme. And also the most important thing is upskilling and reskilling, a short term training program. Now the topic is upskilling and reskilling. This is a, now a keyword in the industry and everywhere we are talking about reskilling and upskilling. The main difference between reskilling and upskilling. Update your skills, stay employed. That means whatever the current job, if you update your skills, you can enhance your capabilities. So that is called by undergoing a new technology, by learning new technology, you can perform better. Reskilling, if you want to change your job or you want to acquire skills, new skills, then that's called the reskilling. So DGT having the option providing a short-term training program for upskilling and reskilling. So in a nutshell, nearly around 4 million people are coming out from the, our ITI system per year. That is a major thing. So this is a big blue collar workforce contributing to the country. So in this angle, what is that industry? Already it has been covered. What is the industrial revolution one or industrial revolution two or a three and four? I appreciate Professor Rajendra Bhava is nicely pointed out. Yes, it is true. The industrial revolution third itself, most of our manpower are not equipped properly because I am an automation expert on PLC SCADA. Most of the engineering college or a polytechnic students coming out from the institute they are not having the industrial exposure, not only the students, even the faculties. The faculty who completed the BE or ME or PhD, he joins university back as a lecturer or a faculty, but he never had an industrial exposure at all. So he is going to train the people who fit for the next industrial revolution, industry fitness. That means it's like a blind will lead another blind. So we need the industrial collaboration is a public private part like industry and the institution to be work together to create the required workforce. So some of the areas and the new job roles already has been discussed. And the top technology now is only the data analytics 85% then IoT and machine learning and their cloud computing. Next is a blockchain and VR AR technologies. What is the issues? Around 75 million jobs are going to be displaced as per world economic estimate. The younger graduate with traditional skills can't fit with new family of jobs. That means we require a reskilling. And the younger graduates are most likely to be employed, unemployed than the older counterparts. IR is not just going to take away your job, it replaces them with a job of newer breed. So New one requires upskilling and reskilling. So we need a smart solution. As per NASCOM report, 39% of the employers face trouble in filling position for the key roles. So as per the evaluating market, around 133 million new jobs are created and 75 million will be displaced. That means it is decreasing the need of human in traditional jobs and increasing creating a new job in the higher rate. So what is the top industrial challenges? We are told, yes, IR is going to create revolution. What is the problem? 
So industries are comp getting complaint that they are not having a trained resource. That means the industry became a training center. So initially the industry has to provide a training for the uh, employer employees. So they take a two to three, one to two years for training the people. So they lose around 25 percent of the total revenue in training the people. If they got a trained people, it can increase the productivity from the day one. So as the pressure joins in the very high level, low level of blue color cadet, the recovery of the instant mate is very, very slow. So after two to three years, if the pressure gets a better opportunity, again, the industry face very high attrition rate, again, it has to stop. So it is becoming a, uh, that now the, that's why the MSME became a training center for freshers established and more established larger industries acquire this resource by paying more higher salary making it difficult for msme to grow faster and bigger so how what we required for this because being the ministry of skill development being the base creating the workforce around three to four million people per year so we want to restructure the current academic framework of itis more industrial in new technology, continuous upskilling of existing IT trainer. This is one of the major area. Even though I got a Mercedes-Benz, if I don't know how to drive it properly, what is the use of the Mercedes-Benz or safety of the Mercedes-Benz? So the trainers is the key role player and they should be trained properly and establish online communication to enable knowledge sharing and work on real life. Support system for IT through adoption and mentorship by local industries. So the key skill trends in the engineering occupation as per the fourth, new and specific technological skills, computer literacy and IT skills, multi-skilling and greater flexibility, and the ability to continue learning and reskilling. This is a 60% only. Remaining 40 to 45% is employability skills. That's the communication skills, team working, getting working with others, problem solving, diagnostics, creative thinking, taking responsibilities, customer awareness. These are all the other part of the life. So core skill is 60% or 50% means your employability skills also plays another 50% of the role. So what we are doing in the digital? So as the digitization is accelerating the transformation in every industry, we need to ensure our students in industrial training institutes are digitally fluent and well equipped to enter in the workforce. So to keep the face with the technology, our 20, approximately our 26 lakhs of trainees in the IT system, we made the employability skill as a mandatory for the part of the curriculum. If for a one year course, 160 hours is the employability skills. And for two years, we made a 240 hours of the employability skills as part of the curriculum. So another major issue is among the IR technology, cloud companies, one of the frontier and front runners, so around the 1 million cloud computing job roles are reported by 2022 as per the uh, reports of ET Bureau. So DG is proactive on this. And we started an industrial collaboration course called Advanced Diploma on IT Networking in Cloud Computing with IBM collaboration in 2018 itself. Initially, it was 18 students as a pilot basis. Now it has grown to 550 students in 2020. So the major advantage or the highlights of this program, the first batch who got 1818, all the 18 students has been got a placement and supported by ITA, IBM. The highlights of the program, the support of IBM under CSR. These students are getting now 3,000 rupees as a stipend for the first 18 months and 15,000 during the internship. And also placement support is provided by IBM and also faculty support. This is more important because it is a future skills. So uh, we our trainers to be equipped properly. So we need the industry experts to deliver the uh, actual content. So IBM is supporting the faculty also. Now we are having the 18 institutes with the 550. It will grow further every year. We are trying to scale up further. Again, to supplement the other IoT, other, other industrial standard 4.0, we also introduced around 11 new age course in the year 2019 last year. One is additive manufacturing 
technician 3D printing, electric and power distribution, geoinformatic assistant, IoT technician smart agriculture, IoT technician smart city, IoT technician healthcare, and remote piloted aircraft like a drone technology, smartphone, soil testing, solar technician, mechatronics, and already we started this year around 56 new ITs also we are given affiliation and we are encouraging the state government to start more and more district each district we want to start one new age course by 2021 so that we want to scale up based on the pilot to enable all these things we need industrial partners so we are collaborating with the various industries like ibm cisco microsoft sap and costa lines and it its ssc nascom and offering the training of trainers and also the students how to enable these future skills for the students. So some of the current industrial partners with IBM, we are offering a two years advanced diploma on IT network and cloud computing. And we also the first in the country to provide a trainers, a training on artificial intelligence. And we are so far we trained around 8,000 IT instructors from 900 play institutes and we are covering around 20 states to provide a just basic of what is artificial intelligence, how to use a, a three days a face to face training followed by online training. Now the COVID situation has really enforced a digital transformation. Uh, so we are going to continue the same program through online and there is a skill build platform, especially with the DGT and IBM is a provide a digital platform for future skills and also along the Cisco where Cisco is establishing the Cisco Network, Network Academy and also Cisco is offering the CCNA certificate and other things with the collaboration with the DGT and also future Cisco calls like cyber security and CCNA courses are offered by Cisco and Costa Lanes makes a employability skills as, a, as I told you, an industrial professional has to train the people so we are providing the, and also we are uh, making a blended content for the employability skills with the support of Cluster Lines and Accenture and also Cisco. SAP also supporting on data science or data analytics. And also we are planning for introducing a new advanced computational skills, those are complete IT. Again, Microsoft already we partnered on trainers of training and on trainees and also certifying the trainees on Microsoft Technical Associate and uh, Microsoft Office Associate and new age skills. And uh, SSC NASCOM is supporting intensively for curriculum development of our ITI, CTS and CITS and new age skills and Adobe. And we are also in discussion with uh, Google and Oracle and AWS, Intel and Geo and other industrial partners also. So in during the COVID situation, uh, we made a very, uh, what we can say, uh, approach of uh, online training through our national instruction media. We conducted around 3,080 uh, online classes for our ITA students and I think around 16 lakh students have been attended and brought into students and we have a portal called Bara Skills, a, a learning management portal which contains uh, course materials, question bank, video lectures and all. In the Bara Skills portal, initially in the before it started in only in the September, October 26th of 2019, uh, before March 23rd, a lockdown period, only around 1,23,000 students only utilize the service. Now, after COVID, this to as on date, around 15,490,000 uh, students has access the Bara skill. That means around 1.14,000,000 people, uh, the usage has increased like anything. Uh, so now our industrial partners like uh, Cisco and uh, also IBM and uh, Costa Lines, they contributed around 1,8 lakh students for training of the trainings. So one of the major issue is trainers training because we are working with the closely with the industries how to train our trainers, how to impart these future skills into the IT ecosystem. So our key dictum is give a fish, give a man a fish and feed him for a day. Instead of that, teach a man to fish and feed him for a lifetime. So that's what we are trying with the industries because we don't want any financial support from any of the industrial partners. 
we want the technology and the human resource support for continuous development of our trainers and our trainees. So I express my sincere thanks to by all my industrial partners like ITS NASCOM, SSE NASCOM, and Cisco, Adobe, SAP, and IBM, and all other people, and also the Axasum for the wonderful opportunity to present on the DGT, how we are initiating the skill development. And I can invite, use this platform for inviting the other industries also to shake hands with DGT on the skill development units. You are most welcome. And also a special thanks to Narayanan uh, Ram Swami, is a KPMG, who is also a, a prime consultant for us in the Strive project. And also uh, Robin and other partners for the wonderful opportunity for inviting this platform. Thank you very much. Naren, you are on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My bad. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. JP. That was a very interesting, exhaustive and informative account of many things that DGT is doing. Uh, of course, I was aware of some. To me also, there was a lot of learning and I'm, I'm really, really uh, amazed by the breadth of activities and also how you bring the best out of, out of your industry partners and also take the best to, uh, you know, the common public, particularly training the trainers. And also all the very best for uh, the, the initiative of having one, uh, you know, forward looking digital uh, skills institute in every district and uh, all the very best for your initiatives. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your time. I know we have overshot our time by by a mile, by multiple miles. So I give, hand it over back to you, Maninder, for your concluding remarks. Well, thank you so very much, sir. I must say one thing that today's session has been very, very informative and very intellectual. I'm sure it has been a very, very learning session for all of us, all the audience and as well as panelists. I would like to summon it up by uh, giving my word of thanks. See, the Industrial Revolution 4.0 is throwing variables into this equation by disrupting the job markets globally. As businesses are adopting newer and emerging technologies, such as artificial intelligence, cloud computing, Internet of Things, etc. Even in the present scenario, the argument still stays that there might just not be enough supply of jobs to meet the immense inflow of candidates. As there is the evidence against it, such as 40% of the employers face trouble in filling positions for skilled roles. This shows the immense gap in the skills needed to fill the available jobs and the lack of it in the incoming workforce. With the immense workforce at its disposal, the skill gap is what needs to be bridged to take advantage of the situation in which our country, India, currently finds itself. Technological advancements have created an impactful spur in changing the global job market. The World Economic Forum estimated that by 2022, almost half the companies across the globe will be adopting automation in some form or the other to reduce workforce on the same tasks. As the machines take over the more routine and pattern-based jobs, there is a higher demand for more human skills and skills related to Industry 4.0 technologies. We at Asocham have been actively participating and promoting skill development initiatives and programs in various parts of India and supporting the Honorable Prime Minister's ambitious project of Skill India campaign, which aims to train over 40 crore people in the country in different skills by 2022. And I'm sure you will be very happy to know that as an Apex Chamber, we are also setting up models on skill development training programs by ourselves getting into training projects like Samarth, DDU, GKY, TITP, and many other programs, along with Ministry of Labor and Employment and Ministry of Rural Development as well. We plan to create a conducive ecosystem for skill development where all can promote the advocacy, research, studies, PPP models, assessments, and industry-driven skilling modules together 
in a very healthy and non-compete manner like what we saw today. I must thank each one of the panelists who were spared such an uh, important time today and who have apprised all the audiences with such useful information. I would like to say special thanks to uh, Mr. Narayanan, to you uh, from KPMG. You have moderated the session really well. Rather, I would say uh, you've taken up this job very, very well. And with that green and fresh background behind you, we were always in that fresh atmosphere. Thank you so very much, Mr. Narayanan. And I would like to thank the Electronic Sector Skill Council of India, Dr. Devraj, who represented that today. Uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Sandhya from NASCOM, Mr. Murugam from Cisco, Mr. Manoj from IBM, Mr. Venkatesh from NSDC, the Andhra Pradesh Skill Development Corporation, Mr. Nayak, you're doing an outstanding job, especially the skill centers. We all have a lot of expectations in seeing that these skill centers are certainly much far and better than what we have seen as ITIs and polytechnics in the past. We also would like to thank you a lot, uh, Dr. JP, sir, uh, for apprising us of all the hard work and focused efforts you have put in to make all this ecosystem a success. We thank Dr. Bhava from Asocha, uh, from Chandigarh University to have given us you know, the importance of the collaboration which is required at the automated panel and the brick and mortar model. Because right now we are in a system where, of course, the IT platforms and everything is moving to practice, but we need to understand that India as a country does not have a lot of infrastructure at many places, and we need to really unite the brick and mortar and online models to make sure that we can get the best out of it. So with this, I think... How are you? So with this... I think uh, we can close the session today. We thank you, all of you, once again for being with us. SOCHAM has been advocating your voices in the past, and we assure you that we will keep doing that in the future, and we look forward to support from each one of you as we got today. Thank you so very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so Manindra. Much. Thanks, SOCHAM, for this great event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Narayanan. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And please stay stay, stay healthy. Thank you so much. And let's be in touch. Thank you. Sir. Have a nice day. Thank you so much.